Hi friends, my name is Lauren DeWitt and I am so, so happy and humbled to be here with you today on the Mission on the Mountain to share with you my conversion story. Um, it's a story that a lot of people here at the Mission on the Mountain had a hand in um, and it is a testimony to the work of the Holy Spirit and I hope it helps you in some way. Now, again, my name is Lauren DeWitt. I am a Catholic convert wife and mother of three. I have a, an eight-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. We live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and like many women, I wear a lot of hats. You're currently homeschooling. I am Christian Formation Director at my parish, which is a new job that um, was a, another total God thing, and I, I didn't see it coming, and it's, it's been such an incredible journey and blessing. Um, and I'm also a, I'm a student in the master's program with the Avila Institute of Christian Formation. And finally, I am uh, the writer behind the Contemplative Homemaker blog and Instagram. Um, again, I'm incredibly honored to be here with you today. Now, I mentioned that I am a convert. I grew up actually Southern Baptist. My dad was a Southern Baptist minister. And I grew up with a really sweet childhood faith. Um, I invited God into my life and was baptized on Easter Sunday when I was six years old. My dad baptized me and it never occurred to me that God was anything other than good and loving and trustworthy. We were at church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night for Bible study. I was there Monday nights for choir practice. I spent my whole summers on mission trips, youth group trips, uh, the whole nine yards. I was in choir, bells, you name it, we did it. My whole life was church. But that all really changed when I got into high school. Like a lot of young people, especially young women, I struggled a lot with anxiety, depression, and feelings of self-worth. I struggled with eating disorders, anorexia. Um, and things got really hard for me. And instead of leaning into my faith, um, like a lot of young people, I threw it away. I got to college and I was so ready to find myself outside of my parents, outside of the traditions I'd been brought up in to figure out who Lauren Ellis at the time really was, um, my own story, my own rules. And um, not realizing that I was buying into something that was wholly unoriginal because it was something the world was selling and that everybody else was doing. And it was living a completely secular lifestyle. I stopped going to church. I stopped praying. Um, I started partying, experimenting with drugs, um, sleeping around, all, all that. I basically, if you take the uh, show Sex in the City, I use that sort of like as a how-to. <laughs> which sounds so stupid now on this side of it, but um, it had everything I was looking for. It was glamorous looking. These women were loved and popular and they were successful. And I wanted that. I wanted so badly to fit in. But the more I dug into what secular society said, the worse I felt. That anxiety and depression that I had mentioned that started in my high school and high school years got worse to the point where I was suicidal by the time I got to my second year of law school. Now, while I was following along this path, I was, I was really at the top of the world professionally. So I guess some of the world's things, um, some of those promises proved true, but it was bad fruit. Um, I was, I was at the top of my law school class. I had offers from all over the Southeast at some of the biggest law firms. But again, like I said, I was at this rock bottom place personally and spiritually. And it was in that moment that I found out I was pregnant. I remember very clearly, I was standing in my apartment bathroom and had that um, black and white penny tile floor and looking at that pregnancy test and seeing two pink lines on it. And I had always been pro-choice up until that point, because again, you know, my body, my choice, I can't let something ruin my career, that type of thing. But for reasons 
that only became clear to me later. Um, I had just enough spark of grace left in me at that moment where I felt God's voice. I had reached my point of desperation. I'd hit what I thought was rock bottom. And it was for me, it was rock bottom. But God met me there. And I prayed for the first time that I'd really prayed in years other than those you know, little prayers you'll send up before you take a test. And I said, God, help me. I knew I couldn't do it on my own. I didn't even know where to start. Now, predictably, my pregnancy had a lot of mixed reactions. My family, um, thankfully, and my close friends were very supportive. Uh, and a lot of people were very supportive, actually. Um, but the same time, a lot of people were extremely not supportive. And those were the voices that threatened to drown everything else out. You know how it is. Um, you, can, you can do a project or something that you're really proud of and 99 people will tell you how amazing it is. But one, one person criticizes and that's all you can think about is that one person. So that's how, that's how it was for me with these negative voices and negative reactions. So I left my law school, I moved back in with my parents and I enrolled at LSU Law School um, and finished my third year of law school out there. Um, it felt like I was in exile. I was born in Baton Rouge, but I had not, I'd left there when I was two years old and my parents hadn't moved back to Baton Rouge until I was in my second year of law school. So I didn't know anybody there. Um, I had lost all my friends. I'd had to turn down the job offers that I thought I was going to take at these big firms. Um, and I was all alone. And I had, uh, I thought my parents would be, my parents were there for me. They were, but they were struggling um, with their own things at that time. When I came home, I realized that my dad was in full blown alcoholism. And so, these bastions of support that I thought would be there weren't. And it felt, a lot of it felt like my fault. Like maybe if I had been a better kid and had lived the right way and hadn't made all these mistakes and gotten pregnant, maybe, maybe dad wouldn't have had to go through that. Maybe my mom wouldn't be having these struggles right now in her marriage and having an adult child come home. And so it was still a really dark time for me, but I had a lot of time to think um, while in exile. A lot of the fluff and the unnecessary things in my life and some of the bad influences in my life and bad lifestyle choices I had been making were forced to be stripped away because of this. And I realized um, that The world wasn't there for me. Um, the pro-choice side that I had really leaned into, this um, moral relativism, this extreme individualism, it had not worked out for me well at all. And I'd heard a lot of people, not just myself, um, but my family, friends, all of that. And now I had this new baby coming into the world that I had to take care of. And while not everybody who was pro-choice um, criticized my decision to keep the baby by any means, the only people who did criticize my lifestyle choices were people who were pro-choice. And by contrast, um, the people who were the most proud of me and there for me, the people who got me into LSU law school, who got me a job, who it brought me into their friend groups and took care of my baby whenever she was born so that I could go back to school and finish and get my law degree on time. Those were all people of faith. They weren't these um, unfun, stodgy people that I had, these stereotypes that I had created in my mind while I'd been at college. These people that wanted to keep women down and didn't want them to succeed. No, they were doing everything they could to help me succeed. And again, that's not to say that, um, you know, my friends weren't able to, it's just these, they were there for me. These, these 
church people that didn't even know me. It was, it was, it was what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that it was unexpected. They didn't have to be there. They had no reason to be there for me. They didn't know me, but they were, and they reached out. And so that really started um, a critical time of transformation in my life for me. I started going back to church. I started getting involved in some Bible studies and um, God continuing this outpouring of grace that I just, it's what grace is. We don't deserve it, right? So he was just pouring this out on me. He put some really wonderful people in my life. Um, one of whom was Ann Trufant, who is here at Mission on the Mountain. Another was Kevin McCall, another uh, Mission on the Mountain. Um, Sarah Hunt, who is Ann's daughter, and several other people of faith that he brought into my life at this time. And again, it, it totally put all of my assumptions about faithful people on their head. These were people that were filled with joy. They had, you know, their own struggles, but they had peace despite it. And this unsinkable joy that wasn't joy, wasn't happiness as the world gives, as scripture tells us, but it was true, pure joy, unshakable, independent of circumstances. And it was really, really attractive to me. So I started asking questions they pointed me to more faithful people who answered questions. I'd come up with new questions. <laughs> They'd find new people to introduce me to. And all these people were so amazing and so happy and so thrilled that I was there and asking questions and they didn't care. Um, they didn't see me as broken or damaged. They didn't care about my past is what I'm trying to say. They were just thrilled that I was there. Um, and as I met these amazing, incredible people, I started reading the gospels and for the first time as an adult, of course, I was familiar with all of these stories from growing up as a child, but, um, they took on new meaning now and they weren't just stories about a historical figure, but there was this real guy, this, this Jesus character, and he was absolutely captivating. I just fell in love. And then I started to pray. And that was the real key turning point for me was prayer. I met Jesus in the gospels and then I started a relationship with him through prayer. And what's so incredible looking back on it was just the way God worked through all these people. Um, I didn't meet God at first in church itself, in the church building necessarily, but I met him in the individuals that I encountered. And because of the kindness, the love they showed to me, the radical faithfulness that they lived their own lives with, the joy of the gospel that they just radiated, that prepped me when I was ready spiritually to start reading the Bible and to start praying and to really get back to church that prepped me to recognize who God was. I wouldn't have been able to recognize him really. I think if I had, if somebody had shoved, I don't know, a deep theological stuff at me when I was first pregnant and first coming back into the faith, but I was able to respond to God in individuals. And so then by the time I was ready for the deeper stuff, uh, it was familiar. It was recognized, I was like, oh, I've seen this story before. I recognize this joy, I recognize this peace, and it started to click for me. I was praying one time with Kevin McCall, and I don't even know if he remembers this, but he said something to me um, that has stuck with me through the years, and it was, God wants to dance with you. He's letting out his hand and he wants to dance with you. And I remember where I was, I wasn't sitting in a parking lot, when I was on this conference call with Kevin praying and I decided, I was like, I'm just going to give him my hand and we're going to dance. And we've been dancing ever since. Now that's not to say um, I'm not a great dancer spiritually or otherwise. I've tripped, I've fallen, I've stepped on God's toes, but we're still dancing years later. Um, he will teach you what you need. You just have to let him lead. 
you just have to follow. I want you to know as you listen to this right now that God is saying the same thing to you. God wants to dance with you. He's reaching out his hand. He wants to draw you in. He wants to take you on this incredible, exhilarating, beautiful dance for the rest of your life. And it's okay if you don't know the steps. It's just okay if you don't know the moves. But the first thing you have to do is just say yes. And for those of you that are already dancing, I want to take this moment to encourage you and to remind you how important it is. Because each of you are the ones that will make a difference to girls like I was. Girls that are lost, that are scared, men as well. Um, those who have been tricked by our secular culture into thinking that anything other than God can be true or lead to, to happiness. You know, I think a lot of times um, we spin our wheels a lot as Christians um, trying to work in the political arena and make big policy changes and all of that is good and it is so necessary. But where the real difference is made is on that individual level. And the reason that is, is because from the secular perspective, there's only one choice that makes sense. Um, in the context of unplanned pregnancies, the only choice that makes sense is abortion. Because if you don't believe in the power of redemptive suffering, if you have never experienced the joy of the gospel or know the peace that the truth can give you, why would you go through the hardship? Why would you go through the exile that I went through? Why would you take out extra student loans that I had to, to finish it? Why would you turn down good job offers, potentially derailing your career? You won't. Um, and, and that holds true for any secular issue. Abortion and unplanned pregnancy is just the easiest for me to talk about because I related to it personally. But the only thing that's going to make a difference is convincing people of that joy of the gospel that I talked about, showing them how much fun you're having dancing with God, even when things hurt in your own life and even when you're experiencing suffering. Um, it's not about catchy slogans or big missionary trips. All of that, again, is good and necessary, but Wherever you are right now, in, you're sitting in your office, your home, if you're about to run to the supermarket, you are a walking temple of the Lord and you are evangelizing by your life. And it's slow evangelization work. It's slow, um, but it's powerful. And I am a testament to that slow work. I am not where I am today because of one thing. I'm here because of the work of many things, um, all of which God had a hand in. My daughter just turned eight. So to give you a, a timeline of how long it's taken me to get where I am. So again, it's slow work, but it's, uh, it's good work. And I wouldn't trade anything, um, any of the hardest days now for the darkness that I knew back then. So I just wanna encourage you one last time um, to anyone watching this to lean into that power of the Holy Spirit. Trust him, feel that joy, remind yourself of that love and that acceptance. If you're looking for it anywhere else, it's gonna be rotten fruit. The only place that you're gonna find good fruit is here. So I'll be praying for each of you. Again, thank you so much for letting me share part of my story with you. And um, God bless.